Hi, my name is Al Gettler. Welcome back to another episode of Leader Be Led. We are going to take you right into our program today because there is so much to talk about. Before we get into it, I'm going to tell you first of all that our guest is Nancy Duarte, who is a world-renowned person uh, just from the standpoint of presentation. I don't think there's anybody finer than her when it comes to defining what makes a great presentation, what makes a speaker get in front of an audience and deliver a message uh, in a way that really cannot be duplicated uh, unless you really dig deep into some of the things that she's put out. But to, to prove our point and to talk a bit about the background, let's take a look at three outstanding presenters and then have Nancy join us. Probably a lot of you know the story of the two salesmen who went down to Africa in the 1900s. They were sent down to find if there was any opportunity for selling shoes. And they wrote telegrams back to Manchester. And one of them wrote, situation hopeless, stop, they don't wear shoes. And the other one wrote, glorious opportunity, they don't have any shoes yet. And I want to say something to the school children of America who were watching the live coverage of the shuttle's takeoff. I know it's hard to understand, but sometimes painful things like this happen. It's all part of the process of exploration and discovery. It's all part of taking a chance and expanding man's horizons. The future doesn't belong to the faint-hearted. It belongs to the brave. The Challenger crew was pulling us into the future, and we'll continue to follow them. Today, Apple is going to reinvent the phone. And here it is. <laughs> no. Actually, here it is, but we're going to leave it there for now. So. So you see three great presenters there, and you certainly can, can take away from that that these are three speakers, three presenters that really know how to deliver something to their audience. My guest today, as I mentioned, is Nancy Duarte. She's the founder of the Duarte Group. Uh, it's a group that's dedicated, probably one of the few in the world out there, dedicated to making presentations better. So Nancy, please join our show. Hey, Thank you. Welcome back. It's good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you. And this is part two of our conversation because we chatted it up too much the last time when we started talking <laughs> about uh, your background. Uh, we're here to talk about today your book, Resonate. And um, you mentioned the last time that this book, which is beautiful in print, is coming out in a free e-edition or a free digital edition. If you could just speak to that for one moment about what's going to be happening here real soon. Wow. I'm super excited about this. Um, what While I was writing the book, I always had this... Um, kind of dual process the whole thing and you can see in the printed book there there's all these green www which means go to the website and we noticed not many people were going to this website where there was amazing like in, in the book I have just a picture of Ronald Reagan but on the multimedia version we segmented out his whole talk and we actually show you what audience he's talking to as he's talking mm. so there's such amazing video and uh, it's so much more immersive you could actually go into Dr. King's speech and interact with it. Uh, we made a whole widget. So it's wow. completely different experience than the static book. And what it was is publishers are in a weird place right now. I had to give my multimedia rights to my book to them, uh, but I retained them in this particular case for 50% verbatim. And they can't do what I just did. Uh, they don't know how to make a multimedia rich book. And I just kind of wanted to show the world how to do it right to set the standard of what a great visual business book should be. Hmm. And uh, to do that, I decided to give it away for free. Well, Nancy, I don't know if it's uh, it's by way of nature, by way of genetics or what it is, but when you talk about getting it done right, you just seem to be a natural at this. And you and your husband started this company uh, producing 35 millimeter, 35, easy for you to say, 35 millimeter <laughs> slides. Uh, and, and now you are, uh, you are well renowned for putting to presentations together for some of the leaders of industry, some of the leaders of the arts, just leaders in general of society. The first thing that you have in your book as a rule is that uh, resonance carries uh, or um, uh, causes change. Resonance causes change. And I think the first three speakers that we started this, uh, this, this off today are three people who do cause change. Now, someone may not be uh, as familiar tuning into to our show today uh, with the first speaker. Uh, I'm kind of proud because he comes from the city that we're yeah, close to, which is Boston. Does. But yeah. tell us a bit about um, why you consider him one of the top uh, examples of a speaker that resonates. You know, what's interesting, so the first person for people who didn't recognize him, that was um, Ben Zander, and he is the conductor of the Boston Pops. And he 
what he's done is he's turned uh, this inspirational talk uh, about possibilities. And at the same time, there was a secondary message about falling in love with classical music again. And so I'll never forget, I actually heard that talk live. It was my very first TED. I'd, I'd never been, and he spoke at the first TED I ever went to. And I wept through mm. the whole thing. I, you could see I, there's a, a, a take where I'm actually in the audience. And my eye, he talks about having shiny eyes that you know you've opened up possibilities abilities in someone's when you can see their eyes shining and my eyes are like <laughs> little laser beams yeah. of shininess and um he's a delightful communicator he uh, his energy is fantastic he used a prop of the piano and walks you through the structure of classical music and he makes you long for it yeah. so i think any presenter who can create a sense of longing and desire of any kind is a fantastic communicator and that's what um mr zander does well you know uh it's it's uh, something I'll admit here on the show, but I wake up to Ben quite often in the morning. Um, ah, <laughs> and that's lucky because, man. <laughs> that's because we have uh, we have a great public radio station here that plays nice. classical music, and the and the symphony is quite often featured on that. And uh, nice. what he what he talks about in his TED talk is just uh, it's absolutely brilliant. And the way that he does it really brings in uh, as you as you uh, talk about knowing your audience and then bringing your audience to a place. Uh, with with the way you present and the story that you tell. Yeah. So the second speaker, <clears throat> you and I watched this uh, once before we actually went live on the air. We both kind of had the same reaction. And that is watching Ronald Reagan address the nation um, after the explosion of the Challenger, which that particular um, spaceship uh, can, had as a passenger, as part of the crew, uh, for the first time, a public school teacher that the entire country was rooting for. And yeah. um, probably more school kids watched the launch of that um, yeah. that mission than, than the Apollo missions yeah. many years earlier. So uh, what is it about Ronald Reagan that made him the great communicator that he was? I love that question. You know, he, I, he was elegant and eloquent uh, as a communicator. He had a lot of practice in front of the camera, obviously, because he came from that. He was, sure. um, you know, he started as the, as a spokesperson yeah. for GE, and he had a way with words that would dissipate. He could be in a very tense situation, and just from the order in which he put his words and the types of views, words he used, he could um, dissipate or rally almost anything under any situation. And right. when you look at that particular speech, this one about the space shuttle disaster, it's the first time a president had to eulogize and address small children at the same right. time. And um, he was brilliant. You know, he talked to, he addressed so many audiences in that little three minute talk. It's amazing. Yeah. He talked to the kids. He talked to the family of the fallen. He talked to NASA. He poked a little stick at Russia a little bit. People don't realize that. It was amazing. Yeah. Um, and then the school children, obviously. Um, he, yeah, he, he was just a brilliant, uh, concise. Uh, the concision of his words were just masterful. And the historical significance of the fact that a president giving up his State of the Union address Totally. To give, uh, maybe, what was that speech? Maybe four or five minutes long yeah. at, at the most? Yeah, super short. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, it's a pretty uh, astounding historical point, too, that mm -hmm. that, you, that you you take the State of the Union and push it aside for that moment. And then finally, right. um, Steve Jobs, who, I mean, a lot of people talk about Steve Jobs and his presentations, but for, for good reasons. That moment yeah. that we saw was uh, the ultimate poke yourself in the eye moment that a CEO could possibly have. So mm -hmm. um, why was that moment of humor, why did it land so smack dab in the middle of the target? Well, I think what happens is he's so brilliant at creating suspense and builds and builds and builds. And so when he's going to do this big reveal, you know, he kind of, like you said, kind of played a joke on the whole audience and it was kludgy and not anything. It was like a, what a phone dial put onto an iPod. And right. um, I, I think that he was heightening. So we're all suspense, suspense, suspense. And then he says he's going to reveal it. And then he kind of pulls it out of his pocket, puts it away, you know? <laughs> and um, he, that's why people just sit with bated breath, waiting and waiting. They, they, millions of people used to tune in and just watch on video as he, as he created this huge suspense around a new product. And so it was a way to kind of have two arcs of suspense instead of just one. 
He's yeah. just brilliant. He's just brilliant. Yeah, yeah, it, it does set a bar very, very high. Today, as we're talking, that the iPad updates have been released, and um, yeah, <laughs> not with quite the same uh, <laughs> delivery as uh-uh. as Steve Jobs had. So, so Nancy, I want to dig a little deeper in, in into your book, Resonate. You had a set of rules. I mentioned that um, you know, first of all, resonance causes change. Your second rule is incorporating story into presentations has an exceptional effect on the outcome. So yeah. that is a, um, that's one of those, those statements that just, you know, makes my mind wander a bit. Tell us what you mean in, in that, in that rule. What happened was um, I went on three, a three-year journey of studying stories. And stories are this container. It's a structure where content can pass down verbally through thousands of generations. Sure. So the structure is not only powerful, but you also feel during a story. People don't realize if you're sitting listening to a good story, your eyes dilate because your body just wants to take more in. Right. You might get a chill down your spine, your heart races, you laugh, you clap, yeah, you jump back, you lean forward. Those are physical reactions to story. Yet in companies today, we fall asleep. Like yeah. presentations are boring and I wanted to figure out what the gap was. And the big gap is that people just don't feel and a story helps you feel. And the other thing that happens, and that's what Mr. Jobs was kind of doing there, was uh, a story builds tension and it builds and then you release it. Right. And then it builds and builds, builds. So that's what he did. He built he built tension and then released it comically. Well, I figured out from studying story and then studying the greatest speeches that one of the classic ways to build tension using a story pattern is the gap between what is and what could be. Mm -hmm. So you build and build this tension about how today is and then you say, but look, here's what could be. And then it, and then you give it a sense of release. So there's a tension and release as a structural pattern that Reagan, Churchill, even Hitler, believe it or not, used, um, Steve Jobs uses, Ben Zander uses. There's this pattern that they've been using, but they didn't necessarily intentionally or even know they were using it. They would just write their speech and work it, work it, work it. And then they're like, you know, it feels done. And they happen to use a persuasive story pattern um, that creates tension and releases it. Yeah, so yeah. that's the power of story. Now, something just hit me as we're talking. I'm the father of three daughters. and uh, Congratulations. Thank you very much. They're beautiful women, all of them. Um, and my wife is a spectacular mother of them and wife to me and successful businesswoman. But nice. we're talking about these communicators and we've said he, 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 he <laughs> all along the way. Um, and I happen to know you have the same name as my wife, so I know Nancy Duarte, uh, you know, happens to be a woman too. So, um, <laughs> what's going on? Why are we only talking about men okay. here? I'm so happy you asked this question because people ask me, who is the most powerful female communicator at the ranks of you know, MLK, like who, and it took me a long time to find this person. And I think it's because she's been hidden. She's a hidden, a hidden person in history. And you will never guess who I'm going to say, because it's Evita. Now there was a movie really? featuring Madonna. There is a, yes, there is a play on Broadway written, And this is, these are written by men that wrote this. <laughs> now the very famous scene where she sings, don't cry for me, Argentina. She's actually holds a big microphone. So when I saw it on Broadway again, I'm like, yeah, I should maybe check out. She looks like she's speaking to a crowd. <laughs> She freaking spoke to two and a half million people. It's the largest gathering to come and hear a woman speak in wow. history. Wow. Nobody had ever transcribed her speeches from Spanish to English. And she is as great of an orator as Dr. King. So, yeah, you know, she was an orphan and she had sex with some politicians. But you know what? She changed so much. She got women to the right to vote. She spent millions on her foundation trying to turn around the uh, fate of the poor. She bought cooking pots, shoes. She created industry for the poor. And the rich hated her, just hated her. So when she's singing Don't Cry For Me, Argentina, believe it or not, she gave her 10-minute talk. At the end of the talk, the audience started to cry out for her to run for the vice presidency. They chanted together. Two million, two and a half million people. And she starts to have a conversation. No, mi compadres, I'm not running for the vice president. My husband, I live for my husband. I'm not running. She went back and forth with this. Finally, she collapsed in the arms of her husband, exhausted, and said, they will not accept that I won't be the next vice president. 
Nine hmm. days later, she had to do another speech on the radio reconfirming. It's called the renunciation speech, reconfirming I'm not running for the vice presidency. She did so much um, for Argentina. She was the first woman to campaign in the, in the Western Hemisphere, first person to campaign for uh, her husband. So she broke a ton of stereotypes, but pop cultures turned her into a slut yeah. And never celebrated her words, never translated them to English. And I, um, and her maiden name is Duarte, which is interesting. <laughs> it's a, wow. <laughs> Evita Duarte Perón. So I'm actually going to be doing a piece uh, about her because uh, I get pretty impassioned about how society has buried who I think is probably the uh, – she was deemed at one time the most powerful woman in the Western Hemisphere. What a double standard and, that you identified some exactly, things that, quote, unquote, exactly. made her, you know – uh, it gave her the reputation that it gave her, but yet there's many male politicians that have far worse uh, reputations. She, so. Actually, from her deathbed, she got to vote. So she pushed it around enough, and it, and it happened in her lifetime. So right. uh, I have a real uh, affection for her. So, you know, talking directly to our audience, talking directly to, uh, you know, uh, women that are out there right now, uh, lean in, of course, be a big hit right now, still on the bestsellers list. Um, yeah. When it comes to communication, what is it that women have to do? I mean, I was saying it, get behind yourself. I tell people who are afraid to get out there and speak, the first thing is to, is to get behind yourself. Once you get behind yourself, um, you know, yeah, then true. there's so much more that you can do. But if you're not behind yourself, who's going to be? So, But yeah. what is it that you would tell, um, from, from even from the standpoint of lean in, which I think is already starting to become a gone full circle and it's becoming um, having the opposite effect in some respects, but yeah. what do you tell women who, who need to understand the importance of communication, what they need to do starting today to, to change the fact that we have looked at all male communicators and the next time we have this conversation, there should be a couple of females sprinkled in there. <laughs> yeah, I do, I do uh, admire Sheryl Sandberg's communication style. I think she's brilliant. I think another brilliant female um, communicator is the CEO of Pepsi, Indra Nui, just completely under-celebrated um, female communicator. Um, interestingly, um, you made a point. One of the things women have to do is actually like themselves. And I think there's a well of confidence that comes from this place of, you know, uh, instead of pity, uh, of power, for lack of, a, for lack of a better cliche word. And... Um, one of the things I love about Avita Peron was the way she connected from her heart with the audience. And, you know, as a woman who is in a position of power in the Silicon Valley, when I first moved here, the first thing I did, we lived in poverty. First thing I did is I went to Goodwill and I bought three suits that looked like men's suits, you know, mm. just to play the part. And now I've had to consciously be like, no, Nancy, you can wear a dress, wear a dress, wear color, wear something colorful, be right. feminine at work, you know. Right. And, and, and even Cheryl kind of mentioned that in her book. But um, I think that women are afraid to lead by our intuition and our heart, which is actually our strength. And Avita Peron, she would tell the followers there, she says, oh, I symbolically press you hard against my heart you know she would talk affects you pour her hearts out and i think that's actually the strength of a woman and in business today it's kind of frowned on yeah. i think the women who took the risk and actually are themselves and as real as possible are ones that do get ahead and what's missing in business right now is a sense of belonging a sense of community and a sense of meaning and that's the one thing that women are natural at we will mm. always build community we build we instead of me right. And so there's a big void there. And I think the woman with a clear enough voice and a clear enough, um, you know, focus could actually change it around. It's an interesting season right now. I think Cheryl's book's creating a lot of desire and a lot of like, I, I, I never thought I'd be part of a woman's movement because I've never had a glass ceiling. I've got to build my own business and, you know, be an entrepreneur. And I, her book made me realize we have a long way to go and it, it made me join a couple of chick groups and <laughs> I'm supporting more women right now because I was always like well if they can't figure it out you know but my answer was just be more like a man doggone it mm -hmm. and now I'm now I'm I've changed my tune quite a bit and it's not really about being more like a man it's having room to be uniquely who we are. Well, that's, that's outstanding. And uh, as a result of this, I throw out this piece of paper because uh, we didn't get to any of it. But I really enjoyed what we just talked about. And I'll be excited to go home and tell my 10-year-old tonight uh, that yeah. she she has something to look forward to. Because I think uh, 
I have a feeling that uh, Nancy Duarte is going to have more to say about this. And uh, Nancy, <laughs> it, is, it has been a, a pleasure. We're out of time. And um, oh. I've taken up so much of your time, and I appreciate the time you've given me. I'll, I'll leave an open invitation to come back and speak some more ab Thank about this, this fabulous uh, subject. But uh, I can't tell you again how much I enjoy the material that you uh, and I know you have a, a great group around you, including your own kids who are part of the company. Uh, yeah. and, and I think that's amazing as well, too. Uh, and your husband is the, uh, the CFO and director of MIS, and uh, it's a real uh, family effort as well as some great employees around you that I've yeah. interfaced with. So congratulations <laughs> on building your great company. Congratulations on helping us as presenters uh, you know, really think more before we get up in front of an audience with, you know, God help us, a PowerPoint slide and, uh, and pour the... Pour the <laughs> the Jesus out of people. So, Nancy, thank you very much. I can't tell you how much I appreciate thank it. Before you, you go, one more time, uh, you need to sell some books because you're going to be giving it away soon. But you need to get this in print. Resonate is just a beautiful book. Uh, I don't think I've had your, your other books up in this uh, in this show. Um, the uh, Harvard uh, Business Review Press uh, book on persuasive presentations. And uh, finally, uh, to me, the one that really uh, had you, uh, you know, uh, hit the map and that's Slideology. So yeah. if we want to learn more about Nancy Duarte and your company, where do we go? You go to www.duarte.com or I'm on Twitter at Nancy Duarte or at Duarte. Outstanding. And I do connect with everyone on LinkedIn that asks me. So Outstanding. Well, that's great. Nancy, again, thank you so much and we hope you have you back real soon. Thank you. All Thanks right. a ton. We'll see you soon. Thanks. Take care. Well, folks, uh, that wraps up another episode of Leader Be Led. Uh, you know, we are we're really proud of, of some of the guests that we have. I'm especially proud actually sitting here today of the show that we just did. And I hope you will tweet about it. I hope you will forward it on to folks and certainly comment about it. With that, I want to thank you for joining us. Tune in again for another episode of Leader Be Led. I'm Al Gettler. Thanks. <laughs>